I think this, and I share this with you a lot, you've, you've heard this probably every time we read this portion of scripture. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, starting with verse 23. And the Apostle Paul is quoting the words of Jesus. Uh, and we could do communion and we could go into the Gospels. But the words of Jesus are quoted here. And I think that this became the first order of service. This uh, repeat here, you might say. And I believe that it was that I believe that the church continued to gather on the first day of the week because that was the, the day Jesus rose from the dead. It was the day that Jesus repeatedly um, appeared to his disciples during those 40 days of uh, when he walked on the earth after his resurrection, okay? So um, there is much evidence to show that this was on the first day of the week. It became known as the Lord's Day. For I have received of the Lord that which also I delivered unto you, that the Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you. This do in remembrance of me. After the same manner also he took the cup when he had supped, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood. This do ye as often as ye drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as ye eat this bread and drink this cup, ye do show the Lord's death till he comes. Wherefore, whosoever shall eat this bread and drink this cup of the Lord unworthily shall be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself and so let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your invitation to this table. And we thank you that you have uh, explained it and helped us understand. And now, after the fact, we understand that you were and are and always will be the Lamb of God, who was slain on our behalf. We so look forward to the day we will see you face to face. But until then, and until redemption is complete, we do as you said we could, and we do as you said we should. We examine ourselves. And we confess our sins before you. We ask, Lord, that you would forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And we claim that promise in 1 John 1, 9. And we ask, Lord, that you would Minister to each and every one of our hearts as only you can. We ask, Lord, that you would bless this bread and that you would bless this cup to our lives, to our minds, to our hearts, to our spirits, that we might draw closer to you that tomorrow we might be more in love with you than we were yesterday. That tomorrow we might walk in more detailed obedience to you than we did yesterday. That we may desire to be uh, used by you more tomorrow than we were yesterday. Or that we allowed you to use us yesterday. So bless these elements, we pray, this bread and this cup. 
and we promise to love you not just in word, but in our deeds. And we ask all these things in the name that is above all names, the name of Jesus Christ our Lord, who is the image of the invisible God, the Most High. And it's in that name we pray. So let it be said. So let it be done. <clears throat> I remember serving in uh, in a hospital in Kansas City, Missouri. I served as a chaplain, a student chaplain. And there were many seminaries in KCK and KCMO that had students there, 17 student chaplains. And um, I remember having lunch one time with a student from a Methodist seminary. And we were discussing things that were relevant to the day. And he blew me away with a question. He knew I was from a Baptist seminary. So he knew I was conservative. <laughs> and he said, so, you really truly believe that, uh, no, he said, so you really truly believe as a Christian, you, you believe in human sacrifice? <clears throat> and I went, human sacrifice? He goes, yeah. You <clears throat> truly believe that Jesus had to die and be sacrificed? in order for us to be saved? And I said, I said, apparently, I said, apparently you have missed who died and why. If you do not believe that, you have missed who died and why. Many Christians and in this case, this guy was going to be a pastor someday in a Methodist church. He was going to miss what Jesus just said here. He was going to totally miss the importance of the blood. That's what I'm going to share with you today. But before that, We'll again remember these words. Jesus says, take, eat, this is my body, which is broken for you. This do in remembrance of me. And then he took this cup. There was a special cup, because they all had their cups to drink with with their meal but he took this ceremonial cup and he said this cup is the new testament in my blood this do ye as often as ye drink it in remembrance of me
there are many churches that have taken the hymns out of the books, the new hymn books, that mention anything about the blood of Jesus Christ. That men mention anything. Are you washed in the blood? And young people that are coming up through the ranks and coming up through the generations that are now in, like, positions of authority and positions of decision-making on some hymnal committee for some big denomination. And they go, oh, I just think those are so gross. <laughs> those songs, you know, that mention the blood of Jesus. The mention, you know, the blood, oh, you know. Just, we, we shouldn't need those. Those are antiquated. Those are old. Those are made, yeah, we don't need to, we don't need to think of those today. And they totally miss the importance of the blood and oh my goodness this is so powerful so I want you to turn with me we're going to go through some scriptures and um, I want you to turn with me to those little books in the back they come after first and second Peter that is first and second third John so I want you to um, go to 1 John chapter 5. And if you have a newer Bible, it probably won't read the same as the King James here. And you can begin to chase that down. You have to go to footnotes. You have to go to, you know, chase down the reason why. <clears throat> So, 1 John chapter 5, verse 5. <clears throat> Who is he that overcometh the world, but he that believeth that Jesus is the Son of God? This is he that came by water and blood, even Jesus Christ, not by water only, but by water and blood. And it is... The Spirit that beareth witness, because the Spirit is truth. For there are three that bear witness, or there are three that bear record in heaven. Now here's where yours might deviate with a different wording. Uh, for there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost. And these three are one. And there are three that bear witness in earth, the spirit and the water and the blood, and these three agree in one. If we receive the witness of men, the witness of God is greater, for this is the witness of God, that he hath testified of his Son. He that believeth on the Son of God hath the witness in himself. He that believeth not God has made him a liar. He that believeth not, God has, he that believeth not, God hath made him a liar, because he believeth not the record that God gave of his Son. And this is the record, that God hath given to us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. He that hath the Son hath life, and he that hath not the Son of God hath not life. Okay. It's very important, verse 6, 7, and 8. But what does it mean? I mean, you've got the Trinity in verse 7, the Father, and the Word, which is Jesus Christ. The Word and the Holy Ghost. And then you've got verse 8. And there are three that bear witness in earth, the Spirit and the water and the blood. What, what is the importance of that verse? Well, I want you to go to 1 John, back to the same author, but the, the Gospel of John. I, I said 1 John, I meant the Gospel of John. Go back to John and chapter 1. I got 1 John. I meant John, the Gospel, chapter 1. And you will, you will hear a phrase that the Apostle John uses. That he says, I bear record. He, he, he's uh, 
a witness and he bears record. And the other phrase is he refers to uh, Jesus Christ as the Word, capital W, okay, Logos. He, he does that. So as you research those 1 John chapter 5, 6, 7, and 8, and, and the controversy that is in manuscripts, and, and just go down that rabbit hole, there are, there are many, and I think there is good uh, evidence to believe that that was penned by the Apostle John. It sounds like him. Okay, so go to uh, first. I'm sorry. Go to John chapter one, verse twenty-six. <clears throat> this is the, the John the Baptist standing in a river, <laughs> River Jordan. And John answered them, saying, "I baptize with water, but there stands one among you, who ye know not. He it is who comes after me." is preferred before me, who coming after me is preferred before me, whose shoe latchet I am not worthy to unloose. These things were done in, in uh, Beth, Bethar, oh, this is, Bethabara. My word is, never mind. So, uh, beyond the Jordan, and John was baptizing. Verse 29, the next day John sees Jesus coming unto him and says, Behold the Lamb of God, which takes away the sin of the world. This is he of whom I said, After me cometh a man which is preferred before me, for he was before me. And I knew him not, but that he should be made manifest to Israel, therefore am I come baptizing with water. And John bare record, here we go again, and John bare record saying, I saw the Spirit descending from heaven like a dove, and it abode upon him, and I knew him not, but that he, but he that sent me to baptize with water, the same said unto me, upon whom thou shalt see the Spirit descending, and remaining on him, the same as he, which baptizes with the Holy Ghost. I'll, I'll read a couple more verses. And I saw and bear record that this is the Son of God. Again the next day, after John stood and two of his disciples, and looking upon Jesus as he walked, he says, Behold, the Lamb of God. And then you can read that rest of the chapter. Some of, some of the disciples that followed John the Baptist ended up following Jesus, okay? So the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, was on the site bearing witness, as was recorded in 1 John chapter 5. Okay? There are three on earth that bear witness, the water, the blood, and the Spirit. So the Holy Spirit was there. Okay? Well, what does this water and, and the blood refer to? Jesus, now, I went and dug out all my big, fat, thick commentaries, and, you know, I think that they're on target when, when they mentioned that Jesus was baptized. He came, he came by the water to be baptized. And that was a big idea, that was a big deal, that was a big event, because the Holy Spirit showed up, and at that moment, God declared, God the Father declared, this is my son in whom I am well pleased. Okay? The Holy Spirit descended upon him. Go to that famous chapter. Flip a little to the right, which is John chapter 3. You know, John 3.16. But we're going to look a little bit at John 3 and the verses earlier. Okay? John 3 and verse 3. Jesus answered and said unto him, now this is Nicodemus, he's having this conversation with Nicodemus, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. 
Now, that's a very important phrase. We've got to understand what it means. Nicodemus didn't know. He said, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter the second time into his mother's womb and be born? That sounds like a dumb question. Uh, but he was not a dumb man. This was a Pharisee. He was educated in the Torah. He was educated in all the Hebrew education. Jesus answered, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, Except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. Born of water and of the Spirit. In 1 John 5, 6, 7, and 8, it says Jesus came by the water, by the blood, and by the Spirit. These three bear witness, okay? So, verse 6. Um, that which is born of the flesh is flesh. Now, that's simple, isn't it? Childbirth, a woman gives birth to a child, right? That which is born of the flesh is flesh. And that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Now back up. It said, I say unto thee, except a man be born of water and of the Spirit. Many are saying that that water there refers to baptism and the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Okay. Verse 6 here says, that which is born of the flesh is flesh and that which is born of the Spirit is, is spirit. Marvel not that I say unto thee, ye must be born again. And then Jesus goes in to explain that. And then, you know, verse 13 is that famous verse, and you'll only see it in the King James. It'll be footnoted in some other um, Bibles. But um, Jesus said, I'll show you a heavenly thing. And he blows Nicodemus' mind. He says, if this is a hard thing for you to understand, how to be born again, I'll show you a heavenly thing. And basically, Jesus is saying, I'm sitting here with you, Nicodemus, and at the same time, I'm in heaven. You ever said to your children, I can't be in two places at once. <laughs> you ever said that? I know I have. Well, Jesus can. Jesus was. And Jesus is. My problem with understanding the nature and character of God is that I have compartmentalized the deity, God Almighty. I have compartmentalized him. I got God the Father over here. Whoa, he's on a big throne up in heaven. He's got this big, deep bass rattling voice that'll shake the earth. You know, I mean, that, that's what I do in my mind, a little boy mind, right? I that, had that ever since I was a little kid. And then, then the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, everywhere present, be with you no matter where you're at, you know? The pilot going Mach whatever five, you know, Holy Spirit catching right up with him. He ain't going to leave him. <laughs> a sailor, you know, a deep, a deep sea diver, whatever, you know, bottom of the ocean, the Holy Spirit's there, you know. So the Holy Spirit is what we call omnipresent. And then Jesus? Hmm. Well, I've always thought that Jesus was localized like you and I because he had a body. Guess what? Jesus said to Nicodemus, you want to you see a heavenly thing? I'll, I'll show you a heavenly thing. And the only way you can interpret Verse 13 is that Jesus is in two places at once. <laughs> That's the only way that it is mind-blowing. Because basically he says, Nicodemus, I'm going to blow your mind. <laughs> so, it's a dangerous thing to compartmentalize God. The uh, LDS people do that. And that's how they got in trouble. Jehovah Witnesses do that. That's how they got in trouble. Okay? We, we, we've got to understand God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit are one. Well, now that's a mind bender right there. But you see the Trinity many, many places in Scripture, but I'm not talking about that today. I'm talking about this importance of the water and the blood, the importance of the blood. So John 3, 3 through 6, Jesus explains... Being born of the flesh is flesh. Being born of the spirit is spirit. Go to... All right, all right, just a minute. The water and the blood. Not by water only, but by water and blood. 
And it is the Spirit that bears witness because the Spirit is truth. That's back to 1 John 5, 6 and 7. You know this verse really well. Go to Matthew chapter 1. Why am I going back over such basic theology 101? Because this basic theology is about to get confronted. This basic, basic theology is about to get watered down and it's about to get discarded just like they're taking the blood of Jesus Christ out of the hymns and the little ones coming up don't understand. They don't understand the importance of it. And that's how Christianity then can be modified, corrupted, and turned into something else. And basically that's what we call a Christian cult. When it is twisted and modified. Okay, so Matthew chapter 1, verse 21. And she shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. Now all this was done that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken of the Lord by the prophet, saying, verse 23, this is a quote from Isaiah 7, 14. Behold, a virgin shall be with child and shall bring forth a son and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which being interpreted is God with us. Now I know that this water and the blood has to do with Jesus' baptism. Like I said, that's a big deal. The Holy Spirit showed up, descended on him, and, and said, this is my son. Okay? Confirmed it. John the Baptist then. It confirmed to John the Baptist what the Lord had already told him, what would happen. All right? And there it happened. And he told his disciples, Behold, the Lamb of God. But I think there's more to it than just the baptism and the blood referring to the sacrifice of Jesus Christ on the cross. I mean, that's, that's pretty simple. You know, he... he was baptized and and the blood was is, is uh, his shed blood on the cross and today we have we we have the the bread and the and the, the wine which represents the blood of Jesus Christ shed for us the atoning work of Jesus Christ but there's more to it first i mean Matthew chapter 1 this is so huge, and the young people have got to get this. This is the bottom line, the foundation, the... Oh, this is the bedrock of Christianity. The need for a virgin birth. Why was that important? The first thing that Jesus, the Son of God, did concerning water was he broke his mother's water. He came, in 1 John 5, he came by water. He was born of a virgin and blood, meaning he had his mother's blood. He was fully human yet because he did not have human father. father that was human, but God the Father, he was conceived by the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. He was pure without the sin of Adam, you see? Mm -hmm. He was not contaminated. He was not contaminated with the blood of Adam. So John chapter, I mean, Romans chapter 5, read Romans chapter 5, and you'll see that Jesus is the second Adam. That sin came in through one man, Adam. But through Jesus Christ, we can now receive a new nature because we receive him. And he is not contaminated by what brought us into the fall of man and the sin upon the whole world. Oh, this is huge. And that Methodist preacher or the Methodist student didn't get that. And I said, you have missed who died and why. Because with the pure blood of who he was, 
fully God and fully man, but with the pure blood, he went to the cross with it for you and for me. That was the only way that he could pull off what he wanted to pull off when he saw what happened in the Garden of Eden right away when they sinned. Of course, you know, how do you, how do you surprise God? <laughs> <laughs> you can't because he has foreknowledge so he knew it was coming but he, when he saw that he says okay I got a plan mm -hmm. Genesis 3.15 he foretold of a savior that would come and there would be enmity between the seed of the woman and the seed of the serpent All right? there would be enmity there would be a war between um, yeah. And the devil would continue to pull off what he wanted to pull off, which was to distort and destroy what God had created in the human race. Okay? So, Hebrews 9, 22. Go to Hebrews 9, verse 22. And this, the, read, read through sometime today the whole chapter, Hebrews 9. Actually, read Hebrews. <laughs> and so, 9.22 says, And almost all things are by the law purged with blood. And without shedding of blood is no remission, no forgiveness, no remission. It was therefore necessary that the patterns of things in the heavens should be purified with these, but the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices than these. For Christ is not entered into the holy places made with hands, which are the figures of the true, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God for us, nor yet that he should offer himself often as the high priest entereth into the holy places every year with blood of others. In other words, the sacrifices going into the holy place of the tabernacle and in the temple later on. But nowadays, go modern times, go to the Catholic Church. They believe every time that you take, they, they call it the Mass and you have the Eucharist, that they believe that it becomes the body and the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ making it a fresh and new sacrifice every time they do that, no matter where that is around the world. Well, that's not what it says here. So verse 26, For then must he, Christ, often have suffered since the foundation of the world. But now once in the end of the world hath he appeared to put away sin for the sacrifice of himself. Once. And as it is appointed unto men once to die, but after this the judgment, so Christ was once offered to bear the sins of many, and unto them that look for him shall he appear the second time without sin unto salvation. Thank you, Jesus. Every single time, all the way through the life of Christ, the Holy Spirit was involved and was a witness. Okay? He came by water and blood. The blood of his mother makes him fully human, but his father in heaven makes him fully God. And being that unique being, he can allow himself to uh, fulfill the laws in heaven, which is that sin is never going to get in. And we, in our sinful state, then could not get into heaven. So he had to do something. And in that way, becoming human, he took it, our sin, the sin of the whole human race, upon himself. And he fulfilled the laws of heaven. But now, in order for us to get in, what do we have to do? We have to accept what he did on the cross. Otherwise, it is not applied to us personally. It is only applied to us or offered to us theoretically. 
Some people think that when Jesus died on the cross, all the human race was was forgiven, the sins of the human race was forgiven, so no matter, so that's all that needed to be done, and so all the humans are going to go to heaven because Jesus died on the cross. No. <laughs> We're only going to heaven because we, have, we accept and, and we receive that gift of grace, and, and we open that gift, and, and then it is applied to us personally, and our sins are forgiven, our, and our sins are taken away, our sins are washed away. Even the sinful nature can be nailed on the cross with Jesus. Therefore, you can overcome sin. That's where we started in 1 John 5, uh, verse uh, 4. It says, who overcomes? What, what's he talking about? Overcome what? Sin. Who overcomes sin? Only he that believes in Jesus Christ as the Son of God. So this is huge. And what this is so basic. But watch. The basics are going... There are those that are going to attempt to totally destroy and corrupt the basics. What are the five foundations of the Christian faith? Again, it is that there is one God. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. But there is one God. Creator... Okay? That the Bible is truth. The Bible is the inspired word of God. The virgin birth. That Jesus is God. The one and only. Jesus, Emmanuel, is God with us. Alright? And then the bodily resurrection of Jesus Christ. The bodily ascension of Jesus Christ. And the bodily return of Jesus Christ. Any one of those Five things, doesn't need three or four, just any one of those five things being distorted or done away with, all of Christianity crumbles. Think about it. You can mull that over all day. The virgin birth is important, but what the Catholic Church did, and we looked at this last week, is they elevated it way out of whack, way up, and, and they borrowed from the mystery religions until she is the queen of heaven, she is the co-redeemer with Jesus Christ, she, oh my goodness, she's more than Jesus made her out to be because all she was was his mother so that he could be fully human and still fully God. So that's what this, that's what this uh, very controversial verse is and, and I believe that I, it's not a controversy for me. I believe the words were penned by the Apostle John because he says he bears record. You know, that, that sounds like John. He says, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Spirit, these three bear record in heaven, and these three are one. But those that didn't want, the, those that didn't want to believe in the Trinity started to marginalize that verse and even took it out. So, um, okay. Um, I know that there is so much happening in the world today, and Dennis came in and he says, okay, I'm ready to hear fire and brimstone. <laughs> you know, and then and sometimes I do that. Maybe this doesn't feel like that because it's coming ahead of the schedule. You'll hear fire and brimstone from me when we see those that are trying to take away these basic doctrines from the Christian church so that they can merge the Christian church and water it down with with other things and end up with four commandments instead of ten and end up with a one world church instead of instead of the true uh, followers of Jesus Christ. Yes, Mary. I was going to say the Antichrist can no way be born of the spirit or flesh or blood or water because he's going to be manufactured and not not born. So I think I think there's there's always more to what Jesus says, and things aren't revealed until the time. Mm -hmm. But when you're thinking about what they're doing to create Superman, oh, I know. That's and, gonna be. Hang on, dude. Mm -hmm. So so uh, when Warren and I went over to to visit that um, that museum on on creation science, and they're trying to build a 
big, huge museum in Boise. Mm -hmm. um, I and, and so they have these these big placards, and they have these different things, fossils, and they got the creation story over here concerning that fossil and and evolutionary story over here, and and I asked them what I believe is a piece of the puzzle that I didn't see. And I think it's a very, very important piece of the puzzle. And that is, as soon as we get to Genesis 3.15, that's the first prophecy of the coming Messiah. All right? I will put enmity between uh, your seed and her seed. You read that. Uh, Genesis 3.15. And immediately... The devil went to work because through the Spirit of God, that promise was given that uh, there would come a Messiah. The devil knew that. And so the devil went to work to corrupt, manipulate, contaminate, kill the human seed. You understand? And he figured if he did that so thoroughly and so totally that the seed of the woman would never then be able to come against him. The Messiah would never be born fully human. Do you understand that? Mm -hmm. And so during the, during the years, as, as uh, Adam grows older, all right, before 100 years, about, I don't know, about 80 years before Abraham, not Abraham, about 100 years, almost well, about 70, 80 years before Adam died, Lamech was born. Now, Adam, Adam lived 930 years. All right, I'll do it this way. He's born over here. He lives 930 years. So in here, about 80, 80 years before Abraham died. 80 years, I believe. Adam. You mean Adam. Adam. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Sorry. Um, so Lamech is born. And I believe a 24-hour day is a 24-hour day once God set the, mm -hmm. set the things in motion in the heavens. So a year is a year. Because they'll try to explain that away. <laughs> it's ridiculous how many things they come up with to try to explain away what is <coughs> not to happen. So Lamech is born here. Lamech lives 777 years. So you put these two men together. In this period of time, the devil goes to work. And Genesis chapter 6, verses 1 through 6, come into play. And that is how the devil tried to destroy the seed of the woman ever coming back on him, trying to destroy what the devil wanted to do. The sons of God saw the daughters of men. And one of the gentlemen at the, at the uh, museum, he said, well, you know, the sons of God is used in the New Testament, and I'm, I'm sure he was referring to John, the Gospel, chapter 1, uh, that, that, uh, that we have received Christ and we can become the sons of God. You mean when talking about Paul Bellman? Because the sons of God are those who follow after the Spirit. In the Old Testament reference, in Job, I'm, I'm off the track and I know I'm watching the time, but in the Old Testament reference of Job, the sons of God refer to the angels. Okay? And God called them all before him, and it said Lucifer was among them. In the Genesis reference, chapter 6, the sons of God, I believe is the same reference, that they are fallen angels. It's the same word. Yes, and it's contaminated. The purpose of that was to contaminate the seed of the woman, that contaminate the seed of the humans, so that that prophecy in Genesis 3, 15, could never come about. That is a huge huge piece of the puzzle if you're going to understand the love of God mm -hmm. and Genesis chapter 6 or Noah's flood. That is huge. Now, oh, 
This is so important because now we have a whole generation flocking to see Russell Crowe and Noah. Mm -hmm. Woo, let's go do that. And it's a whole different take on Noah. And there, many people aren't going to read their Bibles. No. <clears throat> oh, man. So we have got to, as Christians, be in the Word and sorting it out, understanding it, seeking by God's Spirit that He would lead us into all truth. So when you open your Word and you read it, Start with a prayer. Lord Jesus, you promised before you left that you would send the comforter and you would lead us into all truth. Okay, this word is truth. I need it now. And that's the attitude. You come to read the scriptures and the Holy Spirit will help you understand. So I know this, uh, this scripture is, I mean, this sermon is... Um, not maybe the hellfire and brimstone that you were expecting. Well, I'll, I'll end with this. The, the bride of Christ, you and I are the bride of Christ. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 26 is part of that famous portion of scripture to husbands and wives. Husbands treat your, your wives like Christ treats the church and wives treat your husbands like the church should treat Christ. You come to verse 26 of the fifth chapter of Ephesians and it says that he might that Christ might present it that's the bride to himself a glorious church not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing but that it should be holy and without blemish and by the washing of water by the word there you go with the water again he came by the water he came by the blood by the washing of water by the word That goes, that word water, I believe, goes and must go all the way back to his mother's womb. Do you understand that? Because that's the credentials of who Jesus Christ is. Fully human and fully God. And being that, that's the only credentials that he could go to the cross with and it would apply in the halls of heaven, in the laws of heaven, to cover our sin. All right. Heavenly Father, we again are just so blessed with the intricateness of how you brought salvation to us. You love us so much, and you were not afraid to go the distance that we might be in your presence for all eternity. And your plan was not to be derailed. We thank you and we praise you, Lord, and we want to be all that you have dreamed of us being, all that you have dreamed of us becoming. We want to step into that. So bless each and every one of us as we come into a new week. May we not miss any opportunity to share your love and your grace with those that we come in contact with, those that may not know you, Give us the words to say. Those that have fallen away, Lord, give us the words to say to them. And if we have opportunity to talk to those that make laws and make decisions in governmental places, give us the words to say to them. And we ask all these things in the name that is above all names, in heaven and on earth, the name that we love to say and the name the devil hates to hear the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. So let it be said. So let it be done. Amen. All right, then. Okay. Well, I shouldn't make faces. I'm on TV. All right, so. All right, then. We will close with our musical benediction. And uh, so that will take us a minute to get into our circle. The circle is important. I hope you understand and remember. It's here that we can stand face to face. 
All right? You're in the middle. But as soon as soon as we they're having trouble getting into a circle. All right. Smile at me. He's all coming. What is smiling at you? All right. As soon as we leave, as soon as we leave this place, imagine yourselves, no matter where we're at, but imagine yourselves back to back, shields up and swords drawn. Mm. To him who sits on the throne and unto the land. To him who sits on the throne.